as I'm, I'm allowed. <laughs> well, I can give you opportunity, but I cannot give you desire. Does that make sense? Um, I was wondering what to do with this, what I wanted to say. We gave you, I thought about what we gave you opportunity-wise during this thing we're calling 40 days that we did, and then with Mike Cash. So we gave you a dignified, loving, kind preaching and preacher with DeAndre. And we gave you a pulpiteer with Mike Cash. <laughs> and Brother Lee was here, and so I imitate him on how to hold up britches. <laughs> and Brother Wade gave a testimony that was downtown. And I went home and I thought, you know what, Lord? I, I've given them every opportunity. I, I think I've done well as the administrator or whatever you want to call it of the church, as the pastor. I couldn't cause you to desire it, but I certainly offered you lots of ways to come and dine on the Word of God. Today, I want you to think about this. Have you ever been on a mountain? Physically, a real mountain. They are majestic. They have grandeur. They inspire us about what God's doing. They're a place where sometimes in the Bible God dwells there. Physically or what, you know, I mean, literally there. And then there's other places where he uses it as a, a metaphor or whatever about his presence, his grandeur, his majesty. And while we were singing a minute ago, I was thinking about everybody in here, if God had not sent Jesus Christ and then told the apostles to spread out what he had expressed as an, ori an original intent in Hebrews, not Hebrews, but beyond the Hebrews. In Genesis 12, he told Abraham that he'd be a blessing to all the nations, his faith. So I want you to get a hold of something this morning. You could not sit here and get anything out of what we're going to do today You'd have no reason to sit here today if it hadn't have been for Jesus Christ dying on the cross for you and his blood applied to your life. Am I making sense to you? So the sermon title today is Meeting on a Mountain. And there's an assumption for my preaching to be a value to you, there's an assumption that you would like to meet with God. Now that's an assumption. Today I'm going to give you opportunity to appreciate the fact that you can meet with God and I'm going to give you information that should make you really glad and joyful that you don't have to meet with God under the old covenant. And I should give you information this morning that should make you really rejoice that you meet with God if you so desire under the new covenant. So catch as I read my text the Old Testament and then the New Testament out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, which is all New Testament, but what does it refer to? 
Verse 18, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. How many of you would like to come to God under the Old Testament Old Covenant? How many of you would like to meet with him on the mountain under conditions that scared Moses? Now the New Testament, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, a warning. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, and now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. You had pulpiteer worthwhile, godly preaching from our guest evangelist. You've had preaching from a kind, loving, pastoral preacher who preaches the truth. And you had preaching and getting ready to get some of somebody of the style of a prophet, of the calling of a foretelling with vehement desire for a response. And so I read you scripture, and I'm going to tell you just as I start here, you could study this on your own. You could listen to this on the internet. You could have this taught to you by a great teacher. It is not the same as sitting under preaching because I don't know how or why, but God anoints the preacher and the hearers with an opportunity that he affords through what even he describes as the foolishness of preaching. I would advise you today to heed what I'm saying to you in whatever style we say it to you, as a meeting with God through the lips of clay of a servant. Your ears and your mind and your heart and your will down in your gut should be turned Godward. And I want you to rejoice in a minute that you don't have to meet him under the old terms under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, because I want to read it to you again. For you have not come, and we're talking about approaching God on a mountain. 
You've not come like Esau. You're not coming even like Moses, but you're coming today under the Savior Christ. So it says you, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded and it were, if so and if so much as a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling if you were approaching God today and somehow you came to the mountain where the presence of God was dwelling. And if you're lost today, that's exactly what covenant you're approaching God with. You're coming under the old covenant if you've not been a partaker of the new covenant. If you come to the end of your life and you come to God and your reason that he should let you into heaven and the reason that he should take you into fellowship is because you've been a pretty good person. Compared to other people, you're not that bad. Compared to what you've seen out of people who say they're Christians, you might be even better than some of them. If you want to come under the old covenant, are you ready for what you're going to experience when you get there? And meet God not on your terms, but meet God on his terms. Because on his terms, here's the sights. Fire, smoke, darkness, violent wind. We're talking not about how clouds float over a normal physical mountain if it's tall enough and the clouds drag across it. Those of you who've been to the mountains may have experienced when the white clouds cut across the top of the mountain. This is not what we're describing here. We're describing an unquenchable fire that burns with such vehement heat that there is darkness and there's violent wind and it's scary. And it's worse than going up trying to approach the room where the Wizard of Oz was sitting. This is the stuff. God. God who if you look at him, you'll be consumed. If you caught a glimpse of him through the smoke and through the darkness and around the fire. And uh, you could stand the wind you would melt, you would disappear, you would vaporize. Your spirit would speed off to hell and you'd be doomed for coming into the presence of the Almighty. The sounds that you would hear would be the sound of a trumpet so loud that it made you go backwards. Anybody ever been to a military funeral and they play taps? You can't be a normal human and not be moved. This is that a million times different, a million times stronger. This trumpet on the Old Testament, Old Covenant mountain of God would blow so hard and so loud that you'd fall to your knees afraid you would be in trembling because you'd know that you've entered into an awesomeness. How many of you like to say that you talk to God and that God is your friend? Okay, good. We'll get to that in a minute. How many of you like to talk to God when he met you on his terms of the old covenant? The only thing that would make the trumpet not seem loud is when God spoke. And when God spoke, it would be thunderous. My dog, 
took into the house yesterday when it became windy and thundered. And he went to his crate. And my wife went in and covered him up with a little blanket because he had his back turned to the door. He didn't like the rumbling of the thunder. When treat time came, the little chihuahua, five pounds, has no fear of anything. <laughs> and he came to let me know, mm, looking at me, it's time for treats. I said, do you think Bogey will come out and take them? And just as I said that, it thundered a rumbling thunder. It shook the house for real. That was pud thunder. That was not much thunder. If you want to compare it to the sound of God's voice without the shield of the blood of Jesus Christ under the old covenant in the Old Testament, God would speak. And if you didn't want to get on your knees, you might just wind up on your back because the sound of God's voice would echo and thunder and be so strong that you would think I cannot even live through his voice. It's killing me to hear him. I know I can't look at him, but I can't listen to him. He's scaring me to death. Are you listening to me today? Are you messing with your phone? Are you listening to me today? Because you're going to be surprised if you come to God under the old covenant, he's going to blow your phone out of your hand. He's going to blow your thoughts out of your mind. And he's going to blow your strong spine into jelly. Are you listening to me today? You'd have the inability to endure. Too much. Can't handle it. I don't want to hear God anymore. If somehow you survived, you'd say, I'm getting off this mountain. Next time somebody said, let's go to the mountain where God dwells, you'd say, no thanks. I barely got out of there last time. That's how people respond even to New Covenant, New Testament preaching. If you get loud like I just did, millennials Many of them shut down. He yelled. I couldn't take it. Lost millennials are going to wish they could listen to me because this wasn't that bad. How about a voice that you can't take? Many people come and visit a church like this and they say, when I get out of here, I'm not going to this. Whatever. What I'm going to tell you is you're going to have a need to meet God. You're going to have a need to meet God. And when you meet him, you're going to meet him in his place. And when you meet him, you're going to meet him on his terms. And his old covenant terms are unendurable because you couldn't take it. You're going to go where even the beast die. If some animal accidentally or on purpose touch the mountain of God, it would be shot by an arrow or destroyed some other way, stoned or shot with an arrow. So you can't come like Esau. The last verse that I'd read to you about him was he could not bring himself to repent. He cried he begged, but he did not have what it took to have enough desire to repent. Maybe you're sitting here today under a New Testament opportunity, a New Covenant opportunity, and you've rejected God and you think you're cute. You're going to come to him when you decide to come to him. One of these days when you measure it out and think, now I'll call on him, you think you're going to call on him. Brother Cash and I were talking. He loves my oldest son. And he asked, is he still going to First Baptist in West Frankfort? And I said, yeah. 
when my grandson, my son's son, my oldest son's son, they were talking to him in the bedroom. They read to him each evening, as they do now, I'm sure, and they prayed with him. At least one parent would go in and pray with the kids that are going to bed. Tobin, at the time, was seven or eight. He was young. He told them during the prayer, I want to be saved. And the parent who was dealing with him, I don't remember which one it was, questioned whether or not he was old enough to understand what he was doing. And he said, okay. And then he said, but I think God is talking to me. I think Jesus is calling me. And what if I tell him no, and next time he doesn't call on me anymore? Now that's a child. And everybody in here says, Brother Carl, take a chill pill. God would have called on him again. But we sing songs and we preach sermons that tell you he's the God of a hundred chances. He's the God who never quits. He's a million. You could turn him down a million times and then if you called on his name, he'd save you. There's a problem with that because you don't call on him when you take a notion. You call on him when he calls on you. And your heart could get so hard that he doesn't call on you anymore. The Spirit of God does not always strive with man. And you could get so hard that God is still calling, but you got so good at telling him take off, you shut him down, and you hinder the Holy Spirit, and now you don't want to be right with God. Not bad enough to have really repented and become a born-again believer. Are you listening to me how bad it is to come to God under the old covenant. Here's how bad it is. Where even beast, man, or animal can come because it even scared Moses, the friend of God. Moses talked to God quite a bit. And he talked to God on behalf of the people. And in fact, as a foreshadowing of Christ, are you listening? As a foreshadowing of Christ, please catch this, God let Moses be a temporary mediator. Moses pled to spare Aaron and all the ignorant people that made a calf while Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. He ended up coming off the mountain because of their stupidity and their idolatry as a temporary form of Christ. Not as Christ, but a temporary. God allowed Moses to be a mediator. That mediator, when he got on the mountain with no shielding, couldn't stand it. And it scared him. And he wanted off. Is anybody still listening? There used to be boundaries of protection. Some of you do that to people now if you're not careful. You take them somewhere where they can get something they can stand. You protect them from preaching. You excuse them. With all kinds of lighthearted Sissy, baby stuff. They just don't feel good on Sundays. They get sick from 8 o'clock Sunday morning till 11.30 Sunday morning, every Sunday. You just don't know. They're, what they're going through, the last thing they could stand is to come in and listen to somebody like you preach. Let me tell you something. The last thing they can stand is to quit, keep on ignoring preaching. And you don't have to enjoy my style. I'll bring you a pulpiteer. You don't like that? I'll stand up the nice guy who tells the truth. You don't like that? I'll give you somebody with a testimony. I'll give you some kind of gospel. When they just can't stand any of it. Right now they're busy being depressed. Well, yes? Jesus 
That's right. Except that's an argument that doesn't need to be made because God knew before the foundation of the world. Okay, amen. When you, next time you're preaching, I'll give you the full shot. But I got to correct that. I, I believe that. I believe in theory what she's saying, that Jesus would have died for you. That's how personal it is to Lisa. And in that, you need to celebrate and feel good. Amen? Now, I want you to understand this. In God's mind, he knew exactly who was coming for the whole time. So, whatever. Okay, move on, Brother Carl. Yet shall he, yet, shoot, boy, oh boy, it ain't yet. You shall set boundaries for the people all around saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether a man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain, near, close, not on. How would you like it today if you were desiring to come into the presence of God and we said, drive around the building, but don't come in it? What if you said, I want to talk to God and we had to say, don't touch the altar or you're going to get stoned to death or shot through with an arrow because you're so unholy, you can't touch what's been touched by the holy. You can't only not touch God, but you can't touch what he's touched. He touched the mountain. Don't be dumb enough to touch it. Even Moses as the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, feared. Deuteronomy 9. Then I took the two tablets. This is great. He's getting the word of God written on tablets by God to give the people the law of the Old Covenant. Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, wow, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him, to provoke him to anger. There's no oopsie in that. They did it on purpose. They did it wide awake, head on. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. See Moses as the mediator? Moses said, I, was, I came off the mountain, cut off my meeting with God, come down so wound up and fearful and mixture of everything, I threw the tablets down. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron who made the calf, told them to make the calf and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at that time. Then I took your sin, the calf, which you had made and burned it with fire and crushed it and ground it very small until it was as fine as dust, and I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. He totally destroyed the false god, and he ground it into such fine powder that he could throw it down and it would return to the earth. In his typology of Christ, Moses interceded for Aaron and the people of Israel. He gave a temporary restraining prayer. <coughs> God had him do that. 
God had him do that to appease the wrath of God. How would you like to have a high priest? <clears throat> Aaron's the high priest. But the high priest is vulgar. Sinful. Gets bored or impatient or stupid or something and makes a calf, a cow for the people to worship. You know why God, I think maybe God made it be a calf. I've wondered and wondered and wondered about these cows they make in the Old Testament, gold cows to worship. One reason, I think, is because you've got to be really stupid to worship a cow, even a gold one, which makes me think you've got to be really stupid to worship your family. You've got to be really stupid to worship your money. You've got to be really stupid to worship false gods. You've got to be really stupid to worship your pride and your own arrogance and your own choices and the way you think and the way you feel and the way you will, trying to drag God into your situation when you know good and well he's going to have you show up on the mountain eventually. Still with me? Total destruction. No memorial. Dust. Now, is that the bad news enough there? You say, what is the bad news? Sin. Well, well sin, sin, sin in it itself is bad news, but, but what's the bad news about sin? The bad news about sin is somebody would say the devil's going to get us and punish us for our sin. Well, that devil wouldn't punish you for your sin. He's going to get punished for his sin. Who punishes sin? God. My God would never do that. Your God is handmade. Run out and rub his head. The true and living God Destroy sin. You know how marvelously he destroyed sin so that you could take it? He destroyed your sin and not a temporary mediator, but with an eternal lamb. Not a man who would stand in your place for a while and on occasion, but with a man who did no sin died in mine in your place and covered our sin, not like they covered it with temporary sacrifices of lambs, but the eternal blood of the lamb. And he walked us through and walked us to a new covenant in a new testament. Anybody awake? With a new testament in a new covenant with a new mediator who sits at the throne of God, not only on a mountain on the earth, but on the throne in heaven and intercedes for you if you're a Christian every day in all situations and every time you call on him, God turns and sees Jesus taking up your case as your mediator. Anybody in a good mood yet? The mountain of the New Testament covenant is Mount Zion. Hebrews 12, 22. You got that? But you have come to Mount Zion. I want you to get happy. This is not on fire. This one's not covered with gloomy, dark smoke. This one is not clouded so that you cannot see. This one is a bright emerald shining in the tallness and the grandeur and the majesty 
of God Almighty tempered for your sight by the blood of the Lamb. And to the city of the living God. A city. What do you build cities for? You build cities for people to take up residence. How many of you are registered citizens of New Jerusalem? Huh? You got your reservation made? You got your ticket stamped? Are you just a pilgrim passing through? Are you headed home? Is this world your home? Or is that your home? And then when he gets done, this will be your home again because he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. All things will be new. Who's going to be there at this heavenly Jerusalem? City of the living God. And to an innumerable company of angels. You can't even count them. There are going to be so many angels in heaven. You can't count them. Now you say, I can't believe in anything that I can't count. Well, light off into 13 trillion. I'll give it to you in dollar bills. You probably ain't going to live long enough to count 13 trillion in dollar bills. You listening to me? You believe in stuff you've never experienced. Do you believe in things that you're going to experience? And that you've got a little taste of now? Is everybody awake? I'm reading the Word of God and preaching the Word of God to an innumerable company of angels, comma, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to have church with a universal church. This is a local church and that's biblical. This is a universal church and that's biblical. The saints of all the ages, all the Old Testament saints, all the New Testament saints, all the saints who are already in heaven that we knew, all of us who are going to heaven, and all the people who haven't even been saved yet, who God knows they'll be saved, and who will call on his name between now and the end. And this picture that we're getting right here, it's all the above. You don't look too happy. Say it nice, dear. Tell them, yeah, see, tell them, touch them and tell them they're all going to heaven if they're saved. No, really. Oh, yeah. We're all going to heaven. We can get saved. Yeah. <laughs> I'll fill in for cash. I'm not making fun of him or Mike Cash. I was just wondering what it would take to get a rise out of you because I'm talking about going to heaven forever with all the Christians of all the time and all the angels. Well, if that don't get you here, try this. To God, the judge of all. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Oh. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. I'm going to go have fellowship with Moses. Are you? I'm going to go have fellowship with Elijah and Elisha and all the Old Testament believers. I'm going to get to see King David and all the people who believed on the Messiah who would come from the Old Covenant. I'm going to see Jesus Christ. If that don't thrill you right now, maybe you're just emotionally drained, whatever. But if you're saved and you're the quietest person on earth, are you listening to me? If you're saved and you're the quietest person who's ever been born 
inside you somewhere, your light must be going off. Or you don't know who I'm talking about. See, I was talking to him this morning before I got here. And I know because of what he says in his word that he was listening to me. Somebody said, I know he listened to me because I felt it. I can't bank on your feelings. They're as fickle as mine. I know he's listening to me because the Bible said he does. And once in a while he gives me feeling to go along with it. Everybody awake? and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What, what in the world? That of Abel, where'd that come from? Well, Cain was wrong, and Abel was right in their offering. But because I've been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, I'm not coming in my good works like Abel. I'm not coming in my bad works with no chance of getting in because I keep messing it up like Esau. Everybody awake? How many of you are going to bust heaven wide open when you die? Mm. If, if God said you got to say amen to the last thing the preacher said or you're going to burn in hell, I bet you'd have been louder than that. And you're not going to hell if you don't amen my sermon. But you're going to hell if you don't amen the gospel. Because amen doesn't just mean something to say. Amen says, so let it be. I agree. If you say, so let it be, that the gospel permeate my life and the blood of Jesus wash away all my sin then you're under the new covenant. And you are going to see Jesus. And I'm going to watch you. I won't probably be sitting on a stool in heaven. But I'm going to get where I can see you. I'm talking about after we've been there 10,000 years or something. And I'm going to see if you can be as calm and collected as you are right now <laughs> every time you come into the presence of Jesus. Or if you don't have a high speed come upon. God. What's the best thing in heaven? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the best part of heaven. Grandma's going to be there. I'll get to her when, he, when I ever get off my face about being in front of him. It's going to be Jerusalem that won't be on the news all the time because they're fighting over who owns it. It's going to be God's Jerusalem and no doubt about it. Angels, the general assembly, heavenly host, the church universal, the registered from the book of life. A lot of Baptists think they keep that in the office. Because once they fill out their card, they think they got it made, they're going to heaven. Here's your membership card. Firstborn to that Lamb's Book of Life. James 1.18. Of his own he, will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You are his first fruits. You are his first fruits. Philippians 3.12. Here's the key to life. The key to having purpose and the reason for everything. Are you listening? Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Your life, every 
stinking bit of it, every lousy little piece of it, every part of your life, every part of our life, every part of it ought to be doing and being whoever and whatever he laid hold of us for. Now we're trying to lay hold of all the implications of that. You're wasting your life and you're wasting time and effort if you got serving Jesus mixed in with all your crud. All your crud ought to be approached as coming from Jesus. If you're sleeping with somebody you ain't married to, you can't blame that on Jesus. If you're mean, spirited, judgmental, and harsh all the time, that's nothing Jesus laid hold of you for you to do. You see what I'm saying? If you're greedy, stingy, and you got your life full of all kinds of stuff, and if family's first, that's not why Jesus laid hold of you. If Jesus is first, you'll be the best dad or the best mom or the best child or the best cousin or whatever in family that you could be. You'll be a lot better being you when you're being in him than you are ditching him for some secondary priority. You're justified. Perfect. Which is the only way you'll be accepted. I'm not perfect. Well, bless your heart, you're going to hell. Hello? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect in your conduct, but you're perfect in your status or you're going to hell. You see why it's such a big deal that Jesus is your mediator? If Jesus wasn't our mediator and we weren't covered by the blood, we'd go into the presence of God and get burned up again. Are you listening? Are you believing? Jesus is the final mediator. Moses was temporary. We're under a new covenant, which is better than the old, according to what I read you. We're blood-bought. We're not Abel. We're Abel. We're not Abel or Cain. We're not Moses. We're not Esau. We're even better. Now, not better than they are now, but better than they were under the Old Testament. On with the text. Hebrews 12, 17. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Found no place in his heart of hearts. He's conflicted. I believe I'm preaching to some people today who are conflicted. You'd like to be what you ought to be. And from time to time, you truly pursue it. But you didn't get it. You listening to me? You never prayed through. You wanted to punch your ticket. You were impressed with Jesus. You believe he died on the cross. You believe he rose again. But you didn't repent. Repent is when you turn away from your sin and turn to God and all your confidence 
is in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And that's it. And you have a spiritual transaction happen where he called you out and you responded by saying, Yes, Lord. Please save me, O oh Lord. Anybody awake? I want you to go with me right now real quick in your brain to the last, to when you got saved. And then I want you to go to somewhere in the middle. Hurry up. Go to when you got saved. Now go to somewhere in the middle since you got saved and now. And remember about being saved. I want you to remember it at the onset somewhere in your life. And now I want you to remember right now. Is his spirit bearing witness with your spirit right now that you are a child of the king? Discern the spirits. Don't let satanic demons or your own ego whisper in your ear, yeah, 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 I'm saved. Let the Holy Spirit say, you're my child. Let him say it and bear witness to your spirit. You say, Brother Carl, what are you doing to us? Well, I'd like for you to leave here today knowing you're saved. I deal with people constantly who aren't sure if they're really saved or not. You know why? Their lives are so tattered with sin and selfishness that when they approach God, they feel like they're going to the Old Testament mountain. And they never get to rejoice by going to the New Testament mountain. If your life is more about you and how terrible you are and how you don't deserve to go to heaven, I'm going to tell you something else. That's a stupid statement as for a Christian. I don't deserve to go to heaven. Wait a minute. I deserve to go to heaven because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you see the difference in that statement? One is highlighting your sin nature, and the other is highlighting the blood of the Lamb. One makes you sad. One makes you happy. One makes you not respond and not do things, and the other makes you empowered. You've got to know who you are in Christ. It needs to start affecting your speech, even about yourself. I called myself an idiot one time because I forgot something, and an older woman was sitting in a room that, I, room that I was walking through, and she said, well, Brother Carl. And I said, Miss Athelia, I wasn't talking about anybody else. I was talking about me. And she said, I know. And you don't have the right to talk about any of God's children like that. Are you awake? That was a profound lesson from a woman sitting in a half-dark room. Maybe God told her to sit in a half-dark room just so I'd walk through there that day and say something snide about myself so she could correct me. Well, she's not here today, but I am, and I'm correcting you. You're somebody whether you like it or not if you're saved. You know one reason you like to be a nobody? Because that excuses you from any activity. Now that song's not wrong in what it's saying. Everybody's got to correct everything. But what I'm telling you is you're a nobody who is somebody in Christ. Amen? Let's move on. Hebrews 8, 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. <laughs> Man, our covenant 
is the new one from grace and mercy of God, the three persons of God. Anybody, if he just won a million bucks and you was going to the lawyer's office to find out, hear him read the will tomorrow, would any of you get kind of pumped if they was reading off you have one million dollars? It's going to be put in your account at 12 o'clock today. Would you work with me a minute? If you had to respond and act like you're happy about it, I get to everybody's million. I get everybody's million who doesn't look happy about it. I am one rich human being right now. <laughs> this is better than a million. Billion, trillion, kajillion. Hebrews 9.15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal existence. Exodus 24, 8, And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. The old covenant was temporary. The new is permanent. Down to the last part of the sermon, if you'll act like you're paying attention, I'll go fast. I'm going to give you the shakedown and the shook out to stand firm. I tried to shake you up today. I tried to shake you up. I'm trying to shake in your life that which can be shaken. Brother Carl, what's your goal? That what can be shaken will fall. Even your testimony, if it's false. Are you listening to me? I want to shake you to the core of your being. And when I shake you to the core of your being, and all your flesh falls off, and you're standing there, able to look, at nothing but the essence of your being. The only thing I want to leave standing during this sermon is Jesus Christ in you. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. He's speaking from heaven. It's coming through the Holy Ghost. He's speaking to you. He wants you to be his child. He wants you to know you're his child. Then he's going to speak to you. And then he's going to speak through you. Cash said the other night he had a new witnessing plan. Open your mouth. I like that one. When he speaks to you, he'll speak through you. You need to listen and you need to apply. Bring me another screen, I think. You need to listen and apply. Aren't you glad the blood got applied? What if Jesus kept the blood in a big shiny container in heaven? He spiritually used that blood to wash away all your sin. He covered you with that blood so you could approach God in the new covenant. Heed the warning. Open up your reasoning. Speak from your position. Dan, I know you get tired of people probably saying it back to you. You're kind of going, eh. How you doing, Dan? Why does he say blessed and highly favored all the time? He's greeting you from his position. How's it going? I'm a child of the king. I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven when I die. And I walk with Jesus right now. Hey. Would that embarrass you to say that to somebody? 
work with me a minute. I didn't mean just in here. How's it going? I get, I've had, I thought I had everything, I thought I'd been poked and prodded in most of the ways you could get poked and prodded. They biopsied my knuckle. How you feel? I'm going to start answering that to live up to my own preaching. How do you feel? All right. On a scale from one to ten, how is your pain? I've had to tell them, do you mean right now, sitting here on this chair? I'm good. You want me to walk across your parking lot? I'm bad. I knew to start answering with something that matters. How about this? How is how how are you? How are you? I'm a child of the King. How's your pain? Fixing to be gone. How about if I said that to the doctor? No joke, not smarting off. And then what if they said, "What are you? What are you talking about?" And I go, "Oh, you just kicked the door open. You asked me." Amen. I'm going to do this even if it violates HIPAA. <laughs> that covers a lot of stuff. Hebrews 2, 2. For if the word spoken through angels provoked, proved steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us, by those who heard him. Did you hear that part about confirmed? Did you know how come, what helps me to keep believing in Jesus? He does. You know what else? You do. When I get around other people and we're all confessing the same thing, we strengthen one another. Everybody who's saved, help me out a little. Say, I'm saved. I'm saved. Amen. If you're not, you're toast. Hebrews 12:26. The, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he's promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. God is doing a shake-up. And he's going to do a major shake-up. Some of you, more than likely, I don't know who, hopefully none of you, but some are going to get shaken and sifted and they're going to fall through the strainer, and they're going to fall through the strainer and go to hell. That which could be shaken, let it fall. That which cannot be shaken, let it stand more firm than it did before the shaking. Amen? Haggai 2. For thus says the Lord of hosts once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, which is Christ, and I will fill this temple with glory, Amen. says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, the Lord of hosts. I guess if you're going to strengthen your portfolio, and not be totally invested in the stock market. You're supposed to buy gold or silver. But I guess it's in good hands because it belongs to the Lord. The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. You know why that'll preach? Because that's talking about a better covenant and when God reestablishes the temple under the new covenant, it's going to be better than ever. Amen? I'm trying to get through this. I ain't going to give part B because half of you won't be here and a new half will be here. Everybody, everybody can hang on for five more minutes. Say amen. amen. And then you'll be prepared for the next five. Okay. Now this yet once more. Hebrews 12, 27. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that things which cannot be shaken may remain. The shake up or the shake down. Where are you? 
Where's all your stuff? Shook up and standing up or shook down and falling down? Only the firm remains. And there's going to be a final separation. The falling of the fake and weak or the standing of the firm in Jesus. Isaiah 34, 4. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All the host shall fall down. All the leaf falls from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. The shakedown. Isaiah 54, 10. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed but my kindness shall not depart from you thank you Dan nor shall my covenant of peace be removed oh my goodness folks the whole earth's going to get shook down and God's commitment to you will stand how many of you think we're at the latter days of America I'm not positive we're in the latter days of God's coming back. I, I feel that way, but I don't know. But I, we're in the latter days of America. Says the Lord who has mercy on you. Verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We're getting ready to have an unshakable kingdom. I lost half my money that I had stuck around in 2008. I took another big hit not that long ago. Uh, my kingdom can be shaken. My heavenly home and the new earth I'm going to live on is unshakable. I got empowered grace. I'm a loser. I'm a bad guy. I stink. I fail. What? Yes. And then I, re and then I need to repent and crucify my flesh and live empowered grace. I'm also a child of the king. I also have a vibrant witness. I also have a grand testimony. I also have been blessed and blessed and blessed. Anybody awake? which is my acceptable service with reverence to God, respect, and godly fear. I need to serve him in awe and wonder. When you got up to come to church today, did you go, eh, or did you go, I'm going to get in front of the holy God with my holy brothers and sisters, and we're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to sing about him and to him, and we're going to pray to him, and we're going to hear preaching from him, about him. It's going to be a glorious day. Hebrews 12, 29. Get this. It's the basis for the old covenant, and it's still a basis in the new covenant. For our God is a consuming fire. Woo! Burn! When I stand before him, all my wood, hay, and stubble, and all my gold, silver, and precious metal, everything I've done worthy of his name, is going to be refined. And he's going to turn it into reward. And he's going to give me a crown. And then when I get in front of the king... I'm going to lay to his feet. And he's going to give all honor and glory to the Father. The Holy Spirit's already given all honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus lays everything at the Father's feet and then gives him all honor and glory, the Father's going to lay it back to Jesus because they got a thing going on that we don't understand. But I'm going to be there. And he's going to let the glory roll. And he's going to cover me in the blood so I can appreciate it and live through it. Because he's still a consuming fire. But the fire 
is restrained and is wonderful and beautiful because I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. Are you listening to me this morning? Are you covered by the blood of the Lamb? I like to think so. Gag me with a spoon. Is this plane going to make it from here to New York? We like to think so. I ain't riding on that one. Amen? Amen. Unchanging. My God is unchanging. He's immutable. If you come take Berean study or read the book or whatever, somehow you need to find out what immutable means. It means unchanging, but it means more. I'm going to be refined for my good and right, not only my failings. You know, when I step into up to heaven, one of the first things that's going to happen somewhere, he's going to get rid of my junk because it, it ain't coming in. It ain't staying. Amen. He's going to refine me. Then I will be perfect by the blood of the Lamb, but I will be perfected. I won't be as good as him, but I'll be the way he intended me to be. Not kind of, not sort of, not in some ways. I'll be who I was meant to be. I say me, 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 me. You, 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 you. If you're saved, amen. It burns. And usually burns are bad. I'm going to be holy. It says it in the New Testament. It says it in the Old Testament. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That means to be set apart. God is different than everybody and everything, and I'm going to be different than everybody and everything except other believers, and we're all going to be set apart. Last part of it, you ready? Our God. Our God? Our God? My God. Not the God of my imagination. Not the God of my compromise. My God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Peter and Paul and John. The God of Christ. My God. My Father. Can you sing, build my life? Come on, when you're ready. Oh, don't you sing this pretty song unless you're right with God. And if you're right with God, you need to celebrate your rightness with him. And if you're not right, you need to get right. So you people that are right, cover everybody else with an umbrella of praise. And if you're lost, get saved. And if you're saved, get cleansed. And if you're saved and cleansed, celebrate, 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 celebrate. Come to the altar, stand and sing, sit to the glory of God. Whatever you can do, do it. Get in your position of your heart and express it outwardly. Start her up. Mm -hmm.